Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is Elisa Lombard. Elisa is a Saskatchewan-based lawyer and partner at Simiganis Worm Lombard. She is the lawyer heading up a proposed class action lawsuit representing Indigenous women in Canada who have been coerced or forced into sterilization since the 1970s. Although not illegal in Canada, the ongoing practice has come under growing criticism. The courageous women who I have the honour of representing call upon you to govern, to work collaboratively with various orders of government to create solutions to mitigate the harms and losses for the Indigenous women who have suffered this enormous injustice. Further, we call upon you to make reparations to help these women and their families heal from the insufferable dehumanization arising from indifference, negligence, and racism that has been visited upon them. Lisa, thanks so much for doing the show. Maybe if we could start with just a, an explanation of what exactly forced sterilization is. Forced sterilization is a procedure by which uh, a woman undergoes a birth control treatment, if you will, or a sterilization procedure more commonly known as getting your tubes tied uh, without her proper and informed consent. And now proper and informed consent involves uh, a few pillars. Uh, firstly, the woman has to have capacity to engage in the discussion. So any stressors, any difficult environments, difficult circumstances where she's not able to focus on the discussion um, may suggest that she does not have capacity at a particular time. Secondly, uh, there has to be disclosure, full disclosure, of the risks and the consequences. Mm -hmm. Because sterilization is a non-essential medical procedure, meaning that it is never emergent, that increases the obligation of disclosure. Right. And so that disclosure is undertaken or should be undertaken specifically by the operating physician who would uh, provide the patient with information with respect to the risks, the consequences, the benefits of the procedure, as well as any other options. Now, within that full disclosure, there's also the requirement that the woman be given enough time to weigh that information, that information that's been imparted through the disclosure process. And that environment has to be proper. And so it can't be in a situation of stress, of urgency, of anything that would uh, impact her ability to really think about it and come to a decision that is based on her will, her genuine will, mm -hmm. um, in an exercise of her bodily autonomy. Uh, fourth pillar involves an absence of coercion. And so coercion means that a person would be pushed to do one thing or another using various means, threats, um, misinformation, uh, mischaracterization of circumstances, etc. And how prevalent was, is this? Um, well, since we filed a class action or a proposed class action statement of claim in the Saskatchewan Court of Queen's Bench, um, based in part, of course, on an independent report that was authored by Dr. Judith Bartlett as well as Dr. Yvonne Boyer, who is now Senator Boyer, um, 16 women came forward and said that they wanted to provide some information to the interviewers, the independent interviewers or investigators in, in that particular process. And this process was of course uh, launched by the Saskatoon Health Authority, now the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, I believe seven or eight of them came forward in the end. Others could not make it for one reason or another. Most related to their simple inability to show up to share that kind of trauma, though they tried. Um, since then, um, and since we've been raising awareness about the issue on the very clear instructions of our clients, um, 67 women in Saskatchewan have reached out to us to report 
that they have been sterilized without their proper and informed consent um, during labor and delivery. Um, and over 100 women, including those 67 women across the country, have come forward to report similar experiences. Right, so this is a, a Saskatchewan class action. This is where the report came from, but this is uh, something that's taken place right across the country. Correct. And we've also filed um, on behalf of our clients in Manitoba, uh, and we intend to uh, bring the matter into the provinces where um, our clients instruct us to do so. You talk about since it's been in the, the public eye, and I remember when you did your uh, your uh, speech or talk to the committee on this, the uh, health committee, and how shocked some of the parliamentarians were then. Um, when did this start coming out to the public and, and people starting to realize what was happening here? Well, interestingly enough, uh, the, the practice of forced sterilization is not new. Uh, unfortunately, it's really quite old. Mm -hmm. And it has come through in waves since the 1930s. Um, an expert uh, on this issue has authored a, a, a very th thorough um, book on the practice from a historical perspective. And so in, the, as, in as early as the 70s, uh, it was raised in the House of Commons. Um, Minister of Justice Cretchen at the time um, had undertaken to, to have a look into it and to investigate it. Um, from what I can see in the Hansard, not a whole lot uh, came out of that. Um, as far as recent awareness, we're talking about 2015, uh, when the women came forward to the press. And from that, um, the Saskatoon Health Authority uh, commissioned an independent external report. And I would say that that was a direct result from my understanding of uh, our client's insistence, MRLP's very strong insistence that that process be undertaken and that that process be undertaken by Indigenous women, which ultimately it was. What do you think was the reasoning behind health professionals doing this? I don't think racism has much reason. I think that I think that the practice of forced sterilization is symptomatic of um, a colonial hangover, if you will. And I think that it has a lot to do with eugenics, of course, these old ideas that some people should have children and others are not fit to. Mm -hmm. um, eugenics was a widely accepted uh, theory not so long ago. Um, it was a theory that was attempted to be brought into legislation in Saskatchewan and only failed by one vote. It was, in fact, brought into legislation uh, in Alberta and British Columbia. And so the ideas, the ideologies, the consciousness that informs why some people ought to have the right to have children and others, we should prevent them from having children, I think is very much grounded in uh, a belief that uh, some people are fit and others are not, and that bodily autonomy doesn't necessarily determine um, where those decisions lie, but rather those in positions of authority, uh, such as physicians, um, should make those decisions for those who they believe won't. Um, and really, I think that that, that, is, that is the reasoning behind the practice is true systemic racism. And to that point, I guess, do you feel that this is, you know, part of uh, broader problems within the healthcare sector? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think that um, Senator Boyer and Dr. Boyer at the time and, and Dr. Bartlett put it very succinctly and clearly in their independent report where they said um, that they found pervasive systemic racism in the healthcare system despite efforts to remedy these. And so these are strongly held beliefs and um, they come out in this way hurting people very badly. Well, Lisa, much more to talk about here, but uh, just going to step aside for a quick break and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Elisa Lombard and uh, we were talking obviously about the class action uh, that's proposed. Can you give us an update on, on where things are at with that? Uh, with respect to the class action, uh, we're working towards um, uh, cross-examination of our clients 
And so that's where the defendants would uh, ask our clients some questions about their experiences based on what it is that we've submitted to the court and their affidavit evidence. Um, with respect to movement um, at the international level, uh, which of course is not the class action uh, per se, uh, but does have to do with advocacy on this issue to ensure that there are some preventative measures and other measures taken. Um, last year, I believe it was in November 2018 that I attended in, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland to, protect, to present before the United Nations Committee Against Torture mm -hmm. uh, on the practice of forced sterilization and on behalf of uh, our clients. Now. Um, the United Nations Committee did make some recommendations to Canada uh, with respect to investigating the practice, with respect to preventing the, the practice, punishing the practice, and providing some reparations to the survivors, the victims of the practice. Uh, Canada recently issued its interim report to the United Nations Committee Against Torture, I believe on February 21st, and that report uh, said that um, responses to the committee's um, recommendations um, included uh, some calling for meetings amongst provinces and territories to discuss reproductive health, some calls for cultural competency and safety uh, with respect to reproductive health care, uh, also um, some outreach or a center, if you will, uh, in the Saskatoon region where women can and others can report uh, any kind of treatment um, that they felt was unfair, unjust, or uh, did not take account of their bodily autonomy and their right to consent to treatment. Um, and there were a series of other um, discussions about what Canada felt they had done to respond to the committee's recommendations. Here's some more bad news. Yesterday, the Liberals rejected a resolution passed by the First Nations Chiefs to amend the criminal code to outlaw sterilization. How can this be truth and reconciliation? The UN Committee Against Torture has confirmed that Canada is guilty of torturing Indigenous women by forced sterilization. In our clients' view, uh, whatever Canada has done is wholly inadequate and really uh, not measured to the seriousness of the violations that are at stake here. Uh, the United Nations Committee Against Torture unequivocally called for sterilization or sterilization without consent a form of torture and cruel and degrading treatment. And so it's our client's position that such terrible treatment, such egregious treatment, uh, requires some responses that are measured to the harms and that are measured to uh, the egregiousness of the treatment itself. And this is not what has happened in the past year, and we intend to put that squarely to the committee in a shadow report. So what are exactly the, the hopes for the class action? Well, the hopes of our clients are first and foremost that their children, their grandchildren will not experience this, that their daughters will be safe when they go to the hospital in their most vulnerable state to give birth mm -hmm. to their children. That is their first hope. Um, they hope that investigation occurs to ultimately reach that goal, to make sure that those who are in a position of power and authority with respect to birthing women um, do not treat, treat them so poorly, do not invade their bodily autonomy, and do not torture them with a lifetime of sterility against their will. Um, of course, there's a desire for reparations. Um, this practice has destroyed families, has destroyed marriages, has caused siblings to wonder why they don't have more siblings, has affected the self-concept of our clients as women, as Indigenous women, as life givers in their nation. And so although there's no amount of money that can truly compensate them for the pain that they endured and that they continue to endure, both mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, uh, one, a form of reparation is necessary. Also, accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability for those who took the sacred ability from them is front and center and foremost. Yeah, you touched on it there. I mean, the, the impacts that are on your clients, this isn't just a, a physical impact that, uh, that's been felt here. No, of course not. I think um, being a mother and the ability to be a mother is... is it's very difficult to explain the value of that function, uh, either in a family or a society or uh, in any culture. 
But what's certain is that um, I don't think that there's any civilization around the world that does not value that function. The point here is not whether or not women have children. It's whether or not their decisions with respect to having children or not are respected. And that is what this class action is fundamentally about. It's about asserting the bodily autonomy of these women, which was not respected, their dignity, which was not respected in their most vulnerable state while they were giving birth to their last child. You mentioned uh, the United Nations, uh, this health committee, but uh, also taking note of this was the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls who pointed to forced sterilization as, you know, one of the impacts of genocide. Um, what did you make of what you saw and, and heard from the commissioners on that? Uh, what I read in their supplemental report uh, to their final report um, that dealt with the question of genocide was a clear indication that forced sterilization is a form of genocide. And I unequivocally agree, um, as do our clients. Um, that word has been utilized from the moment of first meeting up until this point. And it's not lost on them. It's not lost on any of the women that we represent and that we've spoken with and that we know very well um, that this is what they've experienced in the aggregate, that this theft of their ability to add to their wealth in the form of good relations and, and family and having a, a family of a size of their choosing really is an act of genocide. The UN, Convent UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide is unequivocal in stating that where a state has some form of intent to actively prevent births within a group, this is and constitutes genocide. And so there's no doubt in our mind as counsel, and there's certainly no doubt in the mind of our clients that this is their sentiment around what it is that they've experienced. The loss to their nations is something that is often raised. Uh, the loss of ability to um, pass on rights and title um, and culture and language is, is front and center. Lisa, more to discuss, just going to have to take one more break and then we'll be back here on Face to Face to continue the conversation. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Elisa Lombard uh, and maybe a, a little on, you know, there's a, the committee that's uh, pushing those involved in core sterilizations, providing reparations to those affected. Have any, any health professionals ever faced any consequences over what has gone on here? No. And what does that say to you? That says to me that we have um, a dis that we have disinterested institutions. It says to me that we have institutions and systems that have normalized a subhumanization of indigenous women and their right to procreate. It says to me that. Um, it says to me that the institutions that are responsible for protecting and serving the public don't necessarily view our clients as a part of that public. Sorry. And it says to me that the lives of Indigenous women and children and families simply aren't worth protecting. Is this part of, um, you know, what your hopes are for the class action, that there might be some repercussions for people involved in this practice? Absolutely. Um, Chief Commissioner Lucky of the RCMP appeared before the Permanent uh, House Committee on Health um, and was unequiv unequivocal in, in characterizing the practice of forced sterilization or the act of forced sterilization as a form of aggravated assault uh, under the terms of the Criminal Code of Canada. Now another thing that I didn't mention is that United Nations Committee Against Torture had recommended that Canada close the gaps in its criminal code and that it consider specifically criminalizing forced sterilization. It has not done so and uh, under the leadership of the former Minister of Justice um, it refused to do so. That being said, it's true, there are provisions in the criminal code that could be used to hold people accountable for what they have done. Uh, they have not been used so far. Commissioner Lucky made a public overture and said, well, these lawyers say that they've spoken to many, many women. We would like to speak with these women too for them to provide us 
with a mechanism or, or, or way in which we could look into this practice where we have jurisdiction to do so. Now, of course, that position ignores completely the lack of trust mm -hmm. between law enforcement institutions and indigenous women in this country, which in part was central to the work of the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And so when we say to our clients, we think you should put in a complaint to the RCMP, and we're not saying that we did say that or that we didn't say that, the answer would clearly be, for what? And can we trust them? To which it's really impossible for counsel to say yes, yes you can. And so on that particular issue, we, we take the position that law enforcement does not need a complaint to investigate this practice which has been reported to the public and that in fact it has a duty to warn those who might come across the practice. Um, and it has a duty to investigate. So uh, as far as you know, are there any criminal investigations underway related to this? To my knowledge, no. What's next for the Senate Committee's investigation? I don't know. You'd have to ask the Senate. <laughs> I'm not aware. What is next uh, as we move forward here? Uh, as you mentioned, you know, the, the class action is still proposed, but um, where are things at in terms of what's taking place at the bigger picture? Mm -hmm. Well, we will be moving forward in other jurisdictions in the country. We will also be seeking certification of the class action. We'll continue to be engaged at the international level in pushing for justice for our clients and uh, some measures of accountability, um, as well as, of course, uh, a prevention of the practice. Because another really concerning thing is that when this, um, when this claim began, and when we attended before the United Nations Committee Against Torture, um, we made some very clear statements about how concerned we were and how concerned our clients were about the fact that this practice was likely ongoing. Mm -hmm. Nothing was done. And then on December 13th, DDS, who is now a named proposed representative plaintiff in the Saskatchewan action, was sterilized at the age of 29 years old after her third child in Saskatchewan. PDI, a proposed representative plaintiff in the province of Manitoba, was sterilized at the age of 24 after her second child in a Manitoba hospital. And so these women have experienced something that was entirely preventable, entirely foreseeable, and so we say our job is to continue to advocate for our clients and to seek out um, justice for them as they define it. Elisa, a very uh, important issue, troubling issue, and we uh, really appreciate you taking the time here to speak with us about it. Thank you for having me and thank you for engaging the issue. And that is all the time we have for the show today. We are always looking for new guests, so if you have any suggestions, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. And this episode and all previous episodes are also available as podcasts. You can find those at aptnnews.ca slash face-to-face podcast. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you back here next week.